مكتوب نار Love on the Rocks and <laughs> Caveman, a new comedy starring Ringo Starr and Barbara Bach. And Caveman is just one of five new films we'll be reviewing this week on Sneak Previews, two critics talking about the new movies in town. Across the aisle from me is Gene Siskel, film critic of the Chicago Tribune. And this is Roger Ebert, film critic of the Chicago Sun-Times. Now, in addition to Caveman, Roger and I will also review a werewolf thriller, The Howling, a court martial story from Australia called Breaker Morant, and the new French film about man's need to express his rage, Mon Uncle de Marique. But first, Roger begins with the new Jerry Lewis comedy, Hardly Working. Well, our first movie is one of the most surprising successes of the year so far. Surprising, because it's also one of the worst movies of the year <laughs> so far. Hardly Working is Jerry Lewis's movie comeback after more than a decade away from the big screen. And I was appalled by this entire film. It's so bad, so slow-paced, idiotically written. It's so badly timed that even the usually old, reliable slapstick routines don't work. Jerry plays an out-of-work circus clown in this scene. His sister gets on the phone and tries to help him find a new job. Now, notice the two gags in this sequence. The first one is idiotic, and the second one is a racist stereotype. Very nice, Mr. Rudnick. What time? Fine, I'll have him there promptly at 7 tonight. Oh, yes, he's a great bartender. <laughs> I thought that kind of stereotyping of Japanese went out after World War II. Later on in this film, Jerry gets a job as a gas station attendant, and I'd like you to look at this scene fairly carefully. When Jerry gets knocked over by the car hood popping up, notice that in the very next shot, the hood is back down again. Great editing. Sorry, I know excuses don't mean a heck of a lot, but this is my first day on the job. <laughs> Where are you working tomorrow? <laughs> I don't know. I guess it's supposed to be funny to see Jerry making a fool of himself, but frankly, I thought it was just pathetic. This movie doesn't have fun with the character. It makes fun of the character. You'd have to be cruel to laugh at that guy. 
The movie advertises Jerry as the original jerk, maybe to cash in on Steve Martin's big hit of a year ago. But the trouble is, this movie treats its audience as the original jerks. Hardly Working is a mess, a compilation of scenes that don't build or relate to any other scenes, of characters that make absolutely no sense, of Jerry Lewis trying to be poignant and heroic in one scene, then he's romantic in the next scene, then he's a completely submaronic idiot. The scene after that, there's no consistency. Hardly Working is hardly bearable. I agree with you, and I liked your last point, which is that he's at sometimes romantic, trying to come on and with that woman in the car in the gas station scene. Mm -hmm. Other times, he's a little baby imbecile. Mm -hmm. uh, what I thought of is originally, he needs a partner. He needs <laughs> Dean Martin. Good he needs point. Dean Martin right. to play the romantic <laughs> character. Uh, right. Those old films uh -huh. were quite good and quite entertaining. Lewis doesn't have a foil in this film. As a result, that plus the comedy, which is retarded, mm -hmm. hasn't grown since the old days. Uh, I think it's just an embarrassing kind of film. That shot of him up on the pole there, coughing, yeah. but you use the word pathetic, you're right. Yeah, and the timing is all off, too. Another thing that's funny about this film is all the commercial plugs in it. We think we're watching television. You get the Goodyear tires, mm -hmm. Quaker State Oil. There are about seven scenes in the movie featuring 7-Up and mm -hmm. all these other commercial products, and they're right in the foreground. <laughs> Big advertising that. signs. I you hate know, when I see that. Subliminally, we're supposed to go out and buy oil, Well, I that's guess. how they get the free locations or, or get, maybe get some payment. Who it's, knows? it's a shame. I went to see our next movie, The Howling, knowing it was a film about werewolves, and I suspected that it might be another one of those violent movies where only women get in the neck. Well, I was in for a pleasant <laughs> surprise. I thoroughly enjoyed The Howling, and I think it's one of the best horror films of the last couple of years. It's the story of a television anchor woman attacked in a porno shop as she tries to contact a man suspected of committing a series of gruesome murders. He attacks her in a peep show booth and is shot by police. She, though, has recurring nightmares about the incident, and she recalls them in a group therapy session. Else. Somebody else's breathing is in there with me. It's Eddie, and he closes the door, and he puts a quarter into the slot, and, and the movie starts. And then he whispers something to me, and he whispers something to me, and then he tells me. I can finally turn around and look at him. Turn around. What do you see? What's there, Carol? Karen, what do you see? What's there, Carol? I can't see him. Just try. He's right there. What do you see? What's there, Carol? What do you see, Karen? What's there, Carol? I can't see him. I can't. I can't see him. Her psychiatrist has recommended that she work out her problems at his therapy resort, quite a resort, and it's there that she again encounters the murderer, the same one that apparently had been shot dead in the porno bookstore. Not dead? Hmm. Mm. Maybe the guy's a werewolf. We saw you die. You said on the phone that you wanted to get to know me. But here I am, Karen. Look at me. <laughs> special effects of people turning into werewolves are quite spectacular and quite gross, and I think they use them maybe <laughs> once too often. But the best part of The Howling for me is the general level of tension that the film develops. I got scared. The movie drew me into its world of werewolves, and at the same time, I admired the filmmaking. This movie even made the shadows of werewolves on the wall come alive. It's aggressive, it's gross, it's entertaining. I enjoyed it a lot. Well, you know, I agree and I disagree. I agree that it's a superior <laughs> horror film, and I think that people who like horror films and like werewolves are likely to like this one more than I did. You know, we've talked on previous shows about things like eroticism, humor, and uh, fright. You can't fake them. Either you feel them when you're watching the movie or you don't. I have to admit, I was not scared by this film. And so, for that reason, I don't recommend it. But didn't it. you enjoy the idea of being, weren't, didn't you enjoy your time in the theater while you were watching I, it? I love the guys turning into werewolves, even though it went on and on a little bit too much. I enjoy that. I like some of the backstage humor involving the television newscast. It's a lot more witty than the average horror film. And when you call it a superior horror film, oh. That's, that's your phrase. Right back to you. I think you're right. I'm giving it a, a mixed negative review. In other words, 
I didn't quite like it, but somebody else might. How's that? It's right on the board. Somebody borderline. else might. Me. Somebody else was you. Okay, congratulations. You get a free ticket. I got the, the right week. one. Okay, fine. All right. One of the most encouraging movie developments during the last five years or so has been the birth of a young, healthy, and sometimes inspired film industry out of Australia, a nation not previously known for its movies. And here on Sneak Previews, for example, we've recently looked at such good Australian films as My Brilliant Career and Picnic at Hanging Rock. And now comes the most honored Australian film ever made, Breaker Morand. It's based on a true story set right after the Boer War at the turn of this century. It got, gets its title from Harry Morant, a wild horse breaker or trainer who fought on the British side in South Africa and then found himself being court-martialed for war crimes. Morant and two other soldiers were accused of killing some captured prisoners. In this scene, they meet the young and inexperienced attorney who's going to defend them. As a matter of interest, how many courts martial have you done? None. None? Jesus, they're playing with a double-headed penny, aren't they? Would you rather conduct your own defense? But you have handled a lot of court cases back home, sir. No, no. As a country town solicitor, I handled land conveyancing and wills. Wills might come in handy. I'm going to need a lot of information. Do, do you think they're going to imprison us or cashier us, sir? My father, if he found Have out... Have they told you? There are several murder charges. The penalty's dead. Breaker Moran is told largely as a courtroom drama, and here's one of the most dramatic scenes. An aide to the British commander is called to testify, and he's asked if he ever had discussed the killing of prisoners with Moran's commanding officer, a Captain Hunt. Colonel Hunt. Last July, Captain Hunt took two polo ponies to Lord Kitchener's headquarters in Pretoria, at which time you had a conversation with him regarding war prisoners. Do you recall that conversation? I have no recollection whatever. I have never spoken to Captain Hunt with reference to his duties in the Northern Transvaal. You're a liar! Order! You are under oath, sir. I am aware of that. Major Thomas, I trust you'll agree that closes the issue of the alleged orders to shoot prisoners. On the contrary, sir, I regard Colonel Hamilton's denial as having no bearing at all on the defense. I submit that it is, in fact, inadmissible evidence. A conversation is stated to have taken place between Captain Hunt and Colonel Hamilton. Which conversation was relayed by Captain Hunt to Lieutenant Morant? Now, it really doesn't matter from whom Captain Hunt had his instructions. The fact is clear from the evidence that Captain Hunt did tell his subordinates, not once, but several times, that no prisoners were to be taken. This fact is admitted by witnesses for the prosecution. Captain Hunt's instructions were entitled to be obeyed, which goes to remove any suggestion of malicious intention on the part of the defendants. This entire court martial, sir, should be dismissed. Breaker Moran is an intelligent film, cleanly edited, well photographed, and acted with attention, I think you can probably see, especially in that second scene. But there's a drawback to Breaker Moran, and that is that the form of this film is traditional and I thought very predictable. It's a standard military court-martial drama. Somehow I felt like I'd seen it before and done better in movies like Stanley Kubrick's Paths of Glory, Joseph Losey's King and Country. So Breaker Moran is a good movie, but it's not in the same league with those movies, and I can't quite recommend it. Well, I can. I think the mm -hmm. film is not standard at all. I thought that it did something special. I've seen a lot of uh, films set in courtrooms mm -hmm. where the whole thing is about the gimmicks and the tricks of courtroom work, the legal profession. Mm -hmm. This film, I thought, stayed on the subject of ideas. The whole idea of military men being accused in a wartime situation mm -hmm. of following their orders of their leaders too explicitly. Mm -hmm. And then the top guys to get off the hook later 
mm -hmm. stick it to the to the underlings. So and I thought that was a fascinating idea. I don't think it's the greatest film in the world, but I think it's a lot mm -hmm. better than you're giving it credit. So you uh, like the fact that they got involved in the ideas instead of just getting involved in whether the this attorney is yeah. going to be able to outsmart that attorney and what this yes, guy's story is. Yes, I liked so it a lot. I found it to be a very interesting film. It's another one just like The Howling, totally different genre, but the same feeling. It's just a near miss. Uh, you know, it's says, good film, but not quite. Says, says you. me. Says me, right. You're 0 for 2 as far as I'm concerned. Our next okay. film, Alain <laughs> René's Mon Uncle de Marique, has been described by some critics as a witty comedy of contemporary life. Well, I can't agree. I saw the film as a serious commentary on contemporary life, and it depressed me while I was admiring it greatly, if you can figure that out. <laughs> Mon Uncle de Marique is the story of three people, all upwardly mobile. We see their lives from the viewpoint of a French scientist who narrates the film. The scientist uses these characters to illustrate his theory that human pain and suffering are caused by people feeling trapped because they're not able to express their naturally aggressive tendencies. Here's a scene involving two of the three people being studied, a radio executive and his woman friend. At dinner one night, she accuses his friend of being disloyal in a scene of crippling modern-day tensions. On parle que de lui dans les journaux. Je suis pas d'accord. Enfin, Jean est votre ami, oui ou non? Ça suffit, Jeannine. That kind of sudden attack is what the scientist in the film is talking about, and I accept that point of view, that many of our problems today do grow out of the fact that people have a primal need to express themselves violently and can't control it without dire consequences. For all we know, the attack in that scene could have been caused by that man who reluctantly has learned to be civilized, and his body is now attacking him <laughs> rather than he attacking someone else. My uncle de Marie considers that issue and is also provocative in the way it intercuts among its three characters and the scientist's theories. This is an excellent, thought-provoking film. I well, love now, it. Here's one we're in agreement on, Gene. I liked it a whole lot, too. Mm -hmm. I really admired it. And here's what I especially liked about it. I want to say why. He takes scenes like that in which the human characters have something happen to them or they do something. Mm -hmm. Then later in the film, or at other points in the film, he totally reenacts them using white mice right. in order to illustrate the behavioral scientist's theory that, in many cases, we think we have free will, but actually we're being run by rage or terror or sex mm -hmm. or hunger or something like that. Now, the funny thing was, most of the time in the movies, when I see characters in a narrative situation on the screen, I get involved in the story. Mm -hmm. But here, he worked on my mind in such a way that by the last hour of the film, I was looking even at the narrative scenes and thinking of them in behavioral terms, looking at the people as if they were white mice. Exactly. That was really fascinating. And you go even further than that. You then begin in this film, and I think it's wonderful the effect uh -huh. it has, you begin to examine your own life that way and think, <laughs> if it's true for them, well, then it must mm -hmm. be true for me. And where do I stand in the relationship? What is this in my head, this brain that I have uh -huh. been given, this history of man on this planet. Mm -hmm. Those are big issues. It may sound like the film is, you know, really tough to work mm -hmm. on. I didn't think it was all. I thought it was challenging, enjoyable. I think it's great. I walked out of the movie. I really had to question my motives. I wanted lunch, and I said, <laughs> why? <laughs> right. okay. Let's do something completely different now. We move on to a movie that has nothing at all to do with the Rene film. Mm -hmm. It's called Caveman. It takes place about around one zillion years B.C. when men fought it out with dinosaurs and women wore skunk skin bikinis. The human vocabulary at that time contained only about 15 words, and I think you're going to hear about half of them in this scene, where Ringo Starr makes uh, Shelley Long, saves Shelley Long from being eaten by a prehistoric dinosaur. Yeah. <laughs> 
Dinosaur is about the funniest thing in this movie, mm -hmm. which, which wants to be to caveman movies what airplane was to airport. Well, sometimes the parody succeeds, as when former Oakland Raider John Matusak, as the leader of one tribe, forgets to let go when he throws a rock off a cliff, and so he throws himself all over the cliff along with a rock. But most of the time, caveman isn't very good. It might seem funny to kids, but didn't seem funny to me. One thing, though, at least I did learn the caveman's 15-word vocabulary while watching this film, and in conclusion, I would like to state, by speaking in their tongue and saying that this movie is basically caca. Well, not all the time, for the reason that you mentioned. The dinosaur is terrific. Mm -hmm. But I have to agree with you that the people in this uh, film and all the jokes involving just them are pretty stupid and got boring real quick. Mm -hmm. um, I just love the dinosaur. There's a special effects artist, very famous in the history of Hollywood, Ray Harryhausen. Mm -hmm. He's made a lot of mm -hmm. films about animated stop-action animation, uh -huh. very tough to do. I thought this film is of that caliber. High quality animation. You know, what's strange, it's harder to get timing, obviously, on special effects like that dinosaur, which isn't really there, in a sense, than it is for actors to provide it. And yet, strangely enough, the dinosaur's timing in this movie is funnier, his uh, double takes, his tongue coming out of his mouth right. and so forth, than the, uh, than the uh, timing of the, of the human actor. But let's be clear about it. I think we're both saying very clearly that the film is wildly uneven. Great dinosaur, dumb people. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of great animals, Gene, here's Spot the Wonder Dog leaping into the balcony to sniff out the dogs of the week, the week's worst movies. Well, my dog this week features three apes and three humans, and the apes are more entertaining. <laughs> Tony Danza from TV's Taxi stars in Going Ape as a young man with an inheritance problem. His father dies and leaves Danza three pet orangutans. If he can take care of them for five years, he'll receive $5 million. If not, the money goes to the local zoo, so the <laughs> zoo sends a bunch of comic mobsters out to kill the apes. Now, the orangutans are weird and funny to look at for about half an hour, which is about 30 minutes longer than the humans in the film are appealing. <laughs> Going Ape was undoubtedly based on the success of Clint Eastwood's Every Which Way But Loose, a smash hit that featured one orangutan. <laughs> but three beasts are not necessarily funnier, especially when their human co-stars are such jerks. <laughs> Gee, my dog this week isn't a movie, it's the movie's deceptive advertising campaign. The movie itself is a pretty good horror film called Holy Terror, and the ads promise that it stars Brooke Shields. Well, that's where the trouble comes in, because Holy Terror was first released five years ago under the title of Communion, and then it was released three years ago was Alice Sweet Alice. Now, when this movie was originally shot, Brooke Shields was a little girl only 10 years old, and as Calvin Klein can tell you, she's not 10 years old anymore. <laughs> Shields has a supporting role in the movie as an apparently demented little girl, and it's an effective thriller, all right, but how many title changes is it going to go through in an attempt to cash in on Brooke Shields' recent popularity? Come on, guys. I saw Brooke Shields at the Academy Awards. She's 5 feet 11 <laughs> inches tall now. That's a foot taller than she was when she made your movie. Isn't it time to admit this movie is never going to make it at the box office, no matter how many times you change the title, and even if Brooke Shields is in it? <laughs> Maybe they ought to try Gone with the Wind. You know, that might bring Part in a two. few. Part two. Okay, that'd bring in a few people. <laughs> so much for the dogs. To recap our reactions to the main movies on this show, we both hated the Jerry Lewis comedy Hardly Working, creaky old gags and ugly filmmaking. We can't recommend you see it. We split on the werewolf film, The Howling. I found it to be an entertaining and genuinely scary thriller. I say, yes, go see it. Roger liked the special effects, but he wasn't scared. He says no. <laughs> we also split on Breaker Morant, the story of a famous Australian court-martial. I was struck by the strength of the performances and the direct confrontation of a very real political and moral problem. Roger admired it too, but felt this kind of story had been handled better in other films, and he votes no. We both praise Alain René's French film, Mon Oncle d'Amérique, a study of the modern pressures that overload primitive brains. Ours. <laughs> Two strong yes votes for that one. Finally, 
Neither one of us can recommend Caveman, the parody of prehistoric adventure films. We love the dinosaur more than the humans, but we both say no. Too many dumb gags. So I guess the one we agree on most strongly is One Uncle de Marie, exactly. the uh, French film. And like a lot of films we've liked recently, this is one that doesn't play in dozens of theaters at right. once. You kind of have to go look for it. The other thing that I want to stress about it, I've read some reviews that say it's a difficult mm -hmm. film to understand. And I think that actually people who write that are underestimating the audience. I think this film presents a very provocative, sophisticated idea, right. but does it quite mm -hmm. directly in a fresh and exciting way. I really recommend it wholeheartedly. I, did, I didn't think it was that difficult either, but it was very provocative in terms of inspiring discussions afterwards. Exactly. Great to argue about. And that's it for this week. Next time on Sneak Previews, we'll review more new movies, including Tell Me a Riddle, starring Melvin Douglas in a drama about the trials of old age, Lion of the Desert, with Anthony Quinn fighting in Libya against Mussolini's army, and Windwalker with Trevor Howard in the story of a Cheyenne Indian family and their fight for survival. Until then, we'll see you at the movies. for sneak previews was provided by this station and by other public television stations. Mm -hmm.